Hi, I'm Mike Bress, a defense reporter with the Washington Examiner. I'm here today with Jerry Dunleavy, uh, a House Foreign Affairs Committee staffer for their Afghanistan withdrawal investigation, who in his personal capacity recently wrote a book about the fall called Kabul. Jerry, thank you for being here for, with us. Thanks, Mike. Glad tell to be us, here. Tell us about your book. So the book is, is called Kabul, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to the end. So there's kind of two parts there. Um, you know, this was a 20-year war in Afghanistan, 20 years of fighting, 20 years of mistakes by four different presidents. But ultimately, as our title suggests, and it is the main conclusion of our book, is that when it came to the withdrawal and the ultimate Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, it goes back to President Joe Biden and the bad decision-making that, that he made. You know, a lot of questions get raised about President Joe Biden's age um, and his fitness for the job. And sometimes I think those questions are, are fair, but actually in this instance, this, this was President Joe Biden from, from start to finish. It was his decision. He was the driving force uh, in this policy. Um, and ultimately the rapid collapse of uh, Afghanistan, the decision to pull U.S. troops, U.S. logistics, U.S. contractors, um, the collapse of the, the Afghan military as, as a result of the pulling of U.S. Uh, support. Um, Americans getting left behind, Afghan allies getting left behind, Bagram getting shut down, forcing us to do an evacuation in a small airport in Kabul with not just the city of Kabul, but the entire country now controlled by the Taliban. It all stems back to, to President Joe Biden's poor decision making. Um, and obviously it ended in in a debacle, um, also ended with, with 13 American uh, service members losing their lives. So we all watched this play out on our TVs, uh, you know, in August of two, uh, two summers ago. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about what you've found out and what you've uncovered from uh, either the planning side or the execution side of the plan. Yeah, so let's, let's maybe just talk about one element of this. Okay. This, is, this, is, this is Bagram and the connection between Bagram and the uh, Abbey Gate bombing that, that killed those 13 Americans. So the U.S. decision to shut down Bagram Air Base, a very strategic air base, pretty close to Kabul, um, this, was a, this was a terrible decision and, and a lot of uh, the terrible things that happened in Afghanistan stem back to that decision and stem back to President Biden's artificial cap on the number of troops and his he, sort of the way that he tied the hands of the, the, the U.S. military. So closing Bagram was, was bad for many reasons. First, it's where we should have had it as an option to do an evacuation. It's much safer. It would have been defensible. Um, so you wouldn't have seen this, the, mm. the, the same sorts of uh, mass panic and crowds and chaos uh, as you saw at uh, Hamid Karzai International Airport. Um, and also maintaining Bagram would have allowed the United States to also potentially uh, more forcefully repel the Taliban onslaught. Certainly would have, the Taliban never would have been able to take Bagram, but it's also possible that maintaining Bagram would have allowed us to repel the Taliban from being able to close in on Kabul itself. But when it comes to the connection between, uh, you know, Bagram and Abbey Gate, what not a lot of people know is that the, the, the terrorist, the ISIS-K terrorist who conducted the successful suicide attack that killed those 13 Americans on August 26th, had been a prisoner at Bagram Air Base. He was captured by the United States when he tried to carry out a terrorist attack in India back in 2017. He'd been at Bagram ever since. He was still at Bagram when we closed Bagram in July 2021, and he was only freed when the Taliban took Bagram on August 15th, two years ago. And so maintaining Bagram would have been a great idea, not just for an evacuation, but this guy who killed 13 Americans would have been in a prison cell rather than free uh, with the ability to, to strike us. One thing that uh, you've done in, pa in past work uh, is you've talked about the administration's refusal to say his name. Yeah. Talk, to, talk to me a little bit about, uh, you know, the, what that you know, the implications of that, uh, you know, from, from your perspective. Yeah, so as a reporter and then writing the book, um, the Biden administration has consistently refused to say the name of the ISIS-K uh, terrorist who killed those 13 Americans. But 
Um, we were able to confirm through intelligence sources mm -hmm. um, and through others in the know that the, the, the bomber's name is Abdul Rahman Alagari. Um, he's a member of ISIS-K and he had been captured and imprisoned at, at Bagram and was freed then by the Taliban. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's probably many reasons why the Biden administration doesn't want to say his name, but I think that a, b a big reason is that um, once you start to learn more about uh, who this Ligari character was, you see that this was, this was preventable simply by just holding on to Bagram and not letting this guy out of jail because, you know, the, the Taliban who we relied on for security at Kabul airport as we conducted our evacuation, um, the, the Biden administration was, uh, you know, insisting that they were being businesslike and professional. You heard this from Biden administration spokespeople. You heard it from generals on the ground, businesslike and professional Taliban. Um, and President Biden would also go out of his way to point out, you know, well, ISIS-K and the Taliban are mortal enemies with each other. Sort of the implication being mm -hmm. that we can count on the Taliban to protect us yeah. from ISIS-K. But if the first thing that the Taliban did when they took Bagram was free, thousands of ISIS-K prisoners. I mean, the, it, it was something in the range of 2,000 ISIS-K prisoners were at Parwan Prison at, at Bagram, who were then freed by the Taliban. You know, these are not, the t you, you can't count on the Taliban to, to deal with ISIS-K. And another thing that we point out in our book is that, although they are absolutely enemies who fight each other and kill each other all the time, their bigger enemy is the United States. And they, they had a history, especially the Haqqani element of the Taliban, had a history of assisting ISIS-K with conducting high-profile attacks against the former Afghan government and against Americans, especially in the city of Kabul. One thing you you touched on briefly that I want to bring back around is that when the evacuation was happening and we were seeing, you know, thousands of Afghans uh, afraid to live under a Taliban regime flood the airport, uh, the U.S. was relying upon the Taliban for the outer security ring. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about sort of that reliance uh, and, you know, the Abbey Gate bombing. Yeah. And talk to us about, you know, uh, what you think happened. Yeah. So, you know, this, this is sort of, this is what made the situation so dangerous. I mean, the situation that our Marines and other service members were put in at Kabul airport was that all that we controlled was the airport. The Taliban were providing the outer ring of quote unquote security and controlled the entire city of Kabul and the entire country. So we were pushed down into a tiny spot, a tiny airfield, um, relying on the Taliban. The Taliban, rather than being businesslike and professional, like the Biden administration liked to say, um, you know, they, they were turning Americans away from the gate. Uh, there are instances where they, they beat up American citizens who were trying to get out of Afghanistan. They were beating uh, Afghan civilians and our Afghan allies who were trying to get out. And according to testimony from, from Marines who were on the ground, the Taliban was executing Afghans, especially Afghans who were turned away from the gate or couldn't get through. The Taliban was executing Afghans in full view of, of, the, uh, of the U.S. service members. And because of the rules enga of engagement that had been imposed on us because of the situation that we were in, we weren't able, the, the, the Marines did not have permission to stop the Taliban from, from conducting these horrific things. And that reliance on the Taliban, it, it spawned further problems. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have the testimony from Marine Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews, who said that he had received intelligence describing who the suicide bomber was and believed that he had identified the suicide bomber in the crowd, asked for permission to take a shot from Lieutenant Colonel Brad Whited, who was his commanding officer. His commanding officer said he, he didn't have permission to mm. give Tyler permission, and he didn't know who had that permission and never got back to Tyler. The bomber, the likely bomber disappears into the crowd, and obviously the bombing happened sometime later. Now, in our book, what we found was uh, in these thousands of pages of Pentagon records that were just sitting out there waiting for people to scour, we found a few different things. We found... Uh, that uh, there was testimony that U.S. intelligence on the ground at HKIA uh, knew that ISIS-K was staging in a hotel about a mile and mm -hmm. a half west of Kabul airport, and that the U.S. commanders on the ground, Major General Donahue, asked the Taliban to conduct an assault on that hotel, but that the Taliban never did. In those uh, Pentagon records, we also found witness testimony indicating that a request to strike 
US, uh, a U.S. request to strike ISIS-K in Afghanistan was made before the Abbey Gate bombing, but that the request was denied. And one of the, uh, one of the people who, who testified to pen these Pentagon investigators, who uh, was a guy who said he had target engagement authority in Afghanistan, he indicated that uh, the, the request to strike ISIS-K was turned down because the strike was deemed infeasible by, uh, by the military commanders on the ground due to a negative response from the Taliban. So that just shows just a few more pieces of why we're putting ourselves in a position where we're relying on the Taliban to provide security was a very bad idea and ultimately may have been, you know, one of the reasons that ISIS-K was able to carry out this attack. Thank you very much for your time. I'm Mike Brest once again with the Washington Examiner.